Welcome back to the Orthodox Universalist channel. In this video, we're going to wrap up the short series entitled Biblical Evidence for Universalism. Obviously, we haven't exhausted all the evidence there is for universalism, but I hope I've provided some food for thought to those who are new to the topic and offered encouragement to seekers and supporters of the belief. Having discussed a variety of texts so far, it's time to consider what all the evidence leads to. What would we expect the outcome of this story we're a part of to look like if universalism is true? And does the Bible confirm that outcome? Let's find out. When I glance over my notes and records of the Sherlock Holmes cases between the years 82 and 90, I'm faced by so many which present strange and interesting features that it is no easy matter to know which to choose and which to leave. Some, however, have already gained publicity through the papers, and others have not offered a field for those peculiar qualities which my friend possessed in so high a degree, and which it is the subject of these papers to illustrate. Some, too, have baffled his analytical skill, and would be, as narratives, beginnings without an ending while others have been but partially cleared up and have their explanations founded rather upon conjecture and surmise than on that absolute logical proof which was so dear to him. These are the opening words of Dr. John Watson in the Sherlock Holmes short story, The Five Orange Pips. I went through a season a few years ago when I read virtually all the Sherlock Holmes stories back to back. It was a fun process, and I'll readily admit today that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are still one of my favorite duos in fiction. In every story, Sherlock is on the scent. He recognizes every detail, turns over every possibility in his mind, and considers every clue. But he doesn't draw conclusions early or work backwards. Rather, he lets the evidence speak for itself. Inch by inch, he approaches his conclusions. And then comes the big reveal, when the truth finally comes to light. Of course, the outcome is usually fairly predictable, but that's precisely why it's intriguing. Throughout the story, we've been along for the journey, as every clue was uncovered, and even if we know how they'll all add up, we still enjoy seeing them pieced together into a single, coherent picture. Throughout this series on biblical evidence for universalism, We've discussed many of the clues in Scripture that universalism is true, with the implications of each text pointing like arrows toward a necessary conclusion. It's now time for us to bring them all together and consider what conclusion we should draw. Let's take a few minutes to review the evidence that we've covered. In our first discussion of this series, we talked about the universal fatherhood of God. Centering our focus on Christ's teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, we recognize that he was speaking to both Jews and Gentiles, believers and non-believers, and not exclusively or even primarily to his disciples. And the startling thing to realize is that he told this widely diverse crowd that God was their father, that their father knew what they needed, and that they ought to share their needs with him as his children. Moreover, we acknowledge that Christ, in teaching us to pray for the Father's will to be done and for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, mandated that we not only acknowledge God as humanity's universal Father, but also seek to see the relationship between every single person and God, without exception, restored. Finally, we also acknowledge the relational implications of God's fatherhood. Since no good father ever punishes his children for the mere sake of punishment, it is unfathomable, if God is the father of all people, that he would ever punish any person for the mere sake of punishment. Like any good father, indeed as the best father, he punishes us only to rescue us and all of humanity from far greater peril. He punishes us in order to discipline us so that we might experience the fullness and safety of the very best life possible, both in this life and in the next. In our second discussion, we asked if God will one day be all in all. 
We talked about the declaration Paul makes in Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that just as all men die through Adam, all men will also be made alive through Christ. The language Paul uses in these texts is conclusive. He doesn't leave room for us to limit the number of people that will be made alive through Christ unless we're also willing to limit the number of people that die through Adam. Therefore, since we know that everyone without exclusion dies, we also know that everyone without exclusion will be made alive through Christ. It is true that Romans chapter 5 identifies the need to receive grace and specifically the grace of the gospel to be saved. But it is equally true that he identifies sin as the source of death. If we can't infer from his explanation that some people might not sin and therefore might not die, we also can't infer from his explanation that some people might not accept Christ and therefore live. His statements are crystal clear. As all people die, all people will live. So we are left with the necessary conclusion that one day all people will receive the grace of the gospel of Christ and be saved. In our third discussion, we recognize that the aim of God in Christ was to recognize the whole world to himself. Repeatedly in the New Testament, and particularly in the writings of John, we found that not only believers, but the entire world is at the center of God's salvific focus. He says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 how Paul makes the case that God is the Savior of all people, but especially of those who believe. Having contextually laid out the case that godliness is of value both for this life and for the next, the implication of Paul's message is hard to escape. Those who choose to believe in Christ in this life are especially saved, but not exclusively. Paul indicates, therefore, that the salvation of God wrought in Christ will be sufficient for all people. It will even win those who do not believe in the present life. In our fourth discussion, we considered the doctrine of predestination. We concluded that predestination is clearly biblical, but also that there is ample evidence, both in the Old and the New Testaments, that while some are especially chosen by God, this is really God's way of choosing all people without exception. He chose the Israelites so that they might make God's glory known to all the children of men. And he chose the church, and especially those who lead it, so that being the first to hope, they might be bearers and sharers of God's mystery, revealed in Christ, to unite all things in Christ. Predestination, then, isn't God's way of dividing up humanity between those he loves and those he hates, or favoring one part of humanity and reserving the rest for eternal conscious torment. Rather, it's his way of including all of humanity in his perfect plan to restore all of humanity to himself. He chooses a few not to the exclusion of the rest, but as a way to fulfill his plan to restore health to the rest as well. And finally, in our fifth discussion, we asked the question, will God ever give up on a person? Once again, we considered passages from both the Old and New Testaments, and we discovered real evidence that God will definitely let people stray away from him if they choose to, but also that his love, demonstrated in compassion, never ends. We considered specifically Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 37, where he encounters the corpses of those who have been cut off by God, and see God still at work to revive those that were slain. And we discussed the text of First Peter that talk about Christ descending into the post-mortem prison for those who rebelled against him in life, and discovered that for the early church, this was clearly understood as Christ working to empty the prison house and save those who did not follow God in life. So everywhere, both in life and in death, we find God at work in Christ never giving up on people, but working continuously to reach those who are still far off from him. Okay, so having considered all of this evidence, let's put the pieces together. 
In scripture, we find out that God is a universal and benevolent father, that he intends to reverse the universal curse that was initiated through Adam by making all people alive in Christ, that he has as his target of restoration the whole world, and is actively at work through the process of predestination to reach every person in it, and that whether in this life or the next, he never ceases to pursue his aim in Christ to unite all things to himself. For me at least, the clarity of scripture that demonstrates these points is incredibly hard to deny. If we take every text in context, consider the interpretations of the early church, and keep in mind what God has revealed to us about his own nature and purpose, we begin to find ourselves tumbling towards a single conclusion. In fact, that's exactly what I found happening to me over the course of several years. I believed in everlasting conscious torment, as I've said before, and I wasn't really motivated to question that view. But when I began to recognize the truth we've discussed in this series, piece by piece, my perspective started to shift. Let me use an example. Right now, my daughter is 10 years old. She's into a lot of different things. She loves art, she loves to read, she loves games, and she particularly loves board games. Well, the last couple of times we've spent time with grandparents, she's wanted to play the game Clue. Most of you are probably familiar with it, but let me explain. In the game, there's a big board that's supposed to look like the inside of a mansion. There are also several characters in the game and several weapons. And ultimately, the goal is to find out which character used which weapon in which room to commit a murder. In fact, as I'm writing this, I'm struck by the whole point of this game. I've got to admit that I don't mind the game, but who came up with this? I mean, did a few game designers sit around a table and say, okay guys, we're running out of material. We've made games about candy and about money and about life and about spelling, and we're out of ideas. What should our next game be about? Oh, why didn't we think of it? Murder, of course. Let's make a kid's game about murder. In any case, in the game, you go from room to room and make guesses about who committed the crime. Was it the colonel in the solarium with the brass candlestick or the maid in the library with the revolver? All the while, there's a little envelope that contains the truth about who the killer is, what weapon they used, and what room they were in. As you guess and guess incorrectly, the other players have to share small pieces of what they know and you jot down what you learn as you play and observe until you finally know for sure what's in that little envelope. When someone finally guesses the right answer and opens the envelope to reveal the truth, the game is over. For me, universalism wasn't the thing I expected to find at the end of all my questions when I finally opened the proverbial envelope. It wasn't even on my radar, but then came a point when I realized that it was an actual thing that some people believed. And over the course of several years, as I followed the evidence, I began to realize the weakness of the charges that were hurled against it. Little by little, the alternatives I was convinced of began to fall away, and to my surprise, I find myself willing to say with confidence that in Christ, God was reconciling all things to himself. He is still in the process of making this reality manifest. It's both something he's done already and something that he is still doing. Yet scripture makes it perfectly clear that this is exactly what he's up to. And thankfully, we're not playing a game with God where he's keeping the truth a secret until the end. As Paul says, the mystery has been revealed and we need only consider the scriptures to discover the ultimate outcome that God has planned. Put all the clues together, and what do we get? The answer is found repeated word for word in both the Old and New Testaments. Let's start with Isaiah 45, verses 22 through 25. There, speaking through the prophet, God says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it will be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed, 
all who were incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. The implication of this text, as we've seen with so many other texts, are pretty obvious. God actually swears by himself here that the declaration that he is making is going to come to pass. And this declaration is that every knee will bow to him and swear allegiance. Moreover, he explains that his enemies will come and be ashamed. This is really interesting because you would imagine in the traditional view, if everyone is swearing allegiance to God, then God's enemies would already be done away with. But instead we find the proclamation that all, there's that word again, all who were incensed against God will come along with his host that is swearing allegiance and that they will be ashamed of their former behavior. Even for conventional commentators, the universalistic implications of this text are really hard to avoid. Consider a few snapshots from some popular commentaries. Ellicott says, The faith of Israel becomes the religion of mankind. Benson says, paraphrasing the prophet here, Not only the Jews, but all nations shall worship me and submit to my laws which is signified by the bowing of the knee, a posture of reverence and subjection, and by one eminent part of God's worship, swearing by his name. Barnes says, To bow or bend the knee is indicative of homage or adoration, and the idea is that all should yet acknowledge him to be God. And in the pulpit commentary we read, This universal turning to God, belongs to the final messianic kingdom. So to nearly every commentator, the implications of this text are obvious. And to use the pulpit commentary's word, these implications are universal in nature. But this begs the question, if everyone agrees that this text has universal implications, why aren't more people universalists? If everyone is going to swear allegiance to God, how do we get around the idea that all people will be saved? After all, doesn't Paul say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved? What the popular commentators will say, such as those we just read, is that this universal worship of God is confined to a specific context. Some will point to the millennial kingdom when Christ reigns on earth and say that the text is talking exclusively about everyone that is living on the earth at that particular time. Or post-millennials might similarly say that this is a vision of the future when the gradual progression of the ages has finally led to a time when all men will worship the true God. I've even heard the argument that this text might be confirming that all people will indeed swear allegiance to God, but that such action won't necessarily result in salvation. But keeping in mind the words of Paul that we just read about the assurance of salvation gained through believing and confessing, I find this last view really hard to swallow. The bottom line is that, in one way or another, conventional commentators will find some way to put borders on the proclamation that God gives Isaiah here, and they make the case that every knee and every tongue here is limited to a specific time or place or effect. Yet when we turn our attention to the New Testament, we find Paul quoting this text from Isaiah multiple times and deliberately blowing away any borders that might limit its implications. If you're reading the New Testament straight through, you'll first find a clear reference from Paul to this text in Romans 14 and verse 11. There he's explaining to the Romans that they shouldn't pass judgment on each other in regard to food or drink or holy days since they will all give an account to God on the day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. But it's his interpretation of the text, which he gives in Philippians chapter 2, that I really want to home in on. Have this mind among yourselves, he says, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As far as I can tell, commentators universally agree that Paul's reference to every knee bowing and every tongue confessing here is a direct reference to Isaiah 45. Only in this case, it is at the name of Jesus that every knee is bowing and every tongue is confessing. Whereas in Isaiah, we saw the Lord declaring that every knee will bow. Ellicott explains this well. He says, this is an instance of the significant practice by which passages in the Old Testament, speaking of God, are as a matter of course applied in the New to our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name is the phrase constantly used for worship of God. I will lift up my hands in thy name, says Psalm 63, 4. This denotes worship to Christ, not just through him. This is a confirmation of the Nicene faith. Christ isn't just an agent. He isn't just an archetype. He isn't just the highest of all God's created works. Jesus Christ is God. And one day he will be universally worshipped as God. The New Testament authors believed this. The faithful have believed this since the beginning. And as Christians, we ought to believe it today. That said, let's return to our point and consider the extent of the worship that will be offered. Paul says every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now to understand this properly, we have to keep in mind what we've already learned about Isaiah 45. We're not just talking about everyone begrudgingly bending the knee to God because they have no choice. Isaiah identified this act of worship as a swearing of allegiance and specifically noted the participation of God's enemies engaging in this act, ashamed of their former disobedience. Paul wouldn't have simply dropped this text in the letter to the Philippians without understanding these points. He recognized that what we see in Isaiah is a willing pledge of every knee and every tongue at the name of Christ. With this fully in mind, he gives us a new covenant interpretation of the passage that removes any doubt about its scope. He doesn't simply stop at every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but goes on to identify even the domains in which this will happen. This worship, this pledge of allegiance, will be granted by everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Paul could have simply copy and pasted Isaiah's text, dropped it in this letter to the Philippians, and called it a day. Instead, it's clear he wanted to make sure that his audience really understood the universal extent of Christ's work. It's as if he thought about it and said, I want to ensure that my audience understands that Christ will be worshipped by everyone, not just by the living, not just by people in a particular age, not just by everyone within a particular set of parameters, but by everything and everyone without exception. So how can I say this? I know. I'll identify every space there is, the domains of the living and of the dead, and of the domains from above and below. So he writes, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. In this passage, Paul does his best to disarm all the teachers that make the case that when it comes to the salvific effect of Christ's work, terms like every and all don't really mean what they seem to mean. To Paul, Christ's work was without limit, without boundaries, and will result in a universal response. I think Paul's words here display a vision of what we see if we piece together all the evidence that we have been given in Scripture. If all the clues are set beside each other, we can't help but see a particular picture. What do we get when we recognize God as mankind's universal and loving Father? when we recognize that God in Christ reversed the universal curse of Adam to bring about universal life, that through the gospel, God aimed for the salvation not just of a select group, but for the salvation of the whole world, 
that through the work of predestination, God is working with the precision of a surgeon to restore health to all of humanity, and that God will never give up on a person because his divine love never ceases. Even into the prison of death, Christ descends to preach the gospel and set the captives free. When we take all this evidence into account, I think we see a picture exactly like the one Paul paints for us in Philippians chapter 2, where one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And this is no mere reluctant admission, but a universal pledge of allegiance, ascending to God, even from those who were once opposed to him. Some people are startled or even alarmed when they encounter the doctrine of Christian universalism. Terms like heresy and false doctrine are hurled against it so often and with such a dismissive attitude that it's hardly ever even considered in its proper form within the Christian community. Obviously, I can only speak for myself, but I'll tell you the reason I believe in Christian universalism. I only have one reason, because I can't escape the evidence If I read the scriptures and recognize in them what God has revealed about himself and about his plan for humanity, I can find no alternative stance to take. God help me. I will keep my conscience tethered to the truth. And for me, the truth of Christian universalism is inescapable. Thanks for hanging out with me through this series as we discussed some of the biblical evidence for Christian universalism. In my next video, I'll be kicking off a series on worldview from a Christian and a universalist perspective. I'm really excited about continuing to share this journey with you, so I hope you tune in. Thank you all for your support and encouragement so far. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing, liking, or leaving a comment. Maybe even share it. It really helps out. Until next time, thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist Channel.